On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we shall discover that when one hears Mongolia, one should think of more than just the desert and camels. The environment of the Gobi Desert is so diverse, you can find everything from uncharacteristic ice passes to breathtaking waterfalls and lakes. From the Gobi semi-desert, we will move on to the lush, green, northern Mongolian hillsides that provide refuge for Buddhists. 5,000 kilometers further southeast of the Gobi lies Jordan. We will conclude our journey in the footsteps of Indiana Jones, in the Jordanian Petra, and on the shores of the Dead Sea. But first, we visit the land of Genghis Khan. Gobi, Hanhai, or Gebi. All these words are the names of the Gobi Desert in different languages. The Gobi is one of the oldest deserts in the world. Its surface area is an incredible 1.3 million square kilometers. The Gobi Desert remains largely unexplored due to its immense size. It stretches between the Altai mountain range in the north, the Tibetan Plateau in the southwest, and the Great Wall of China in the southeast. Its extreme size goes hand in hand with extreme temperature differences. In the winter, the temperature can drop as low as minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, while in the summertime, the temperature can climb up to 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Only a few living beings survive such drastic temperature differences. One of the adventurers that got carried away by the magic of the Gobi Desert was Sven Hedin, a Swedish discoverer. He described his caravan as follows. Our camp, with its many packages and animals, made a very picturesque appearance, and it gave me a feeling of deep satisfaction to think that all those things were mine. It can be stated with confidence that not much has changed since in the Gobi Desert. Five ecoregions are found in the Gobi, each of which has an entirely different soil composition. Each year, the desert claims several extra kilometers. The southern reaches of the Gobi have been devouring pastures on the Chinese border for the last 20 years. Each year, the greedy masses of sand absorb 20 centimeters of rainfall. That's not a lot of rainfall, but people and animals can adapt to even the harshest of conditions. In search of better pastures, the Mongolians migrate up to four times a year. Their entire household, complete with yurt, travels along with them. The art of assembling and disassembling the yurt has been perfected over the millennia. It is just another facet of the nomadic lifestyle. The yurt is constructed to withstand bitterly cold weather. Four people are required to assemble it. A trap is stretched over the wooden framework and then it's lined with hides and other firm materials for making the yurt waterproof during periods of rain and as insulation during cold nights. The resulting area that they live in is not particularly large, but it serves these nomads very well. The complete erection process of the yurt takes just a few hours. It's perfectly eco-friendly. When the Mongols depart in search of greener pastures, no trace of their habitation is left behind. Recently, the yurts have become increasingly more popular with the environmentally conscious living in both Europe and the United States. The women are in charge of the interior decorations. They incorporate many colorful rugs and other decorative items throughout. These nomadic herdsmen know the Gobi Desert inside out, especially its inhospitable but more appealing southern part. It is found in the middle of a national park. 
the peaks of the Gurvan Saikan Ul mountain range seem to blast skyward. When translated, its name means the Three Beauties, even though the dark and rocky mountains feel quite gloomy in real life. The base camp for the expeditions into the mountains is equipped with yurts and herds of the load-bearing Bactrian camel. A sought-out sandy desert, the Kongorian Els, or Singing Sands, lies at the foot of the mountain. The dunes rise 300 meters high, 12 kilometers wide, and 100 kilometers long. Under the watchful eye of the three beauties, they seem to be the guardian of secrets. It is said that directly beneath the surface of this sandy kingdom lives the mythical worm Olgoi Chorchoi. The worm is said to attack humans from behind and suck out all their blood. The many animal skeletons found in the desert are more likely manifestations of severe heat or drought, and not so much the Olgoi Chorchoi. The desert is known to be unmerciful to lost animals and people. The giant worm story could easily have started with the ramblings of a delirious lost soul. Several historical records, and even some cryptozoological enthusiasts, actually mention the existence of the Algoi Chorchoi. But predominantly, this creature is only alive in the minds of the local people and their shamans. It is supposedly bright red in color, spits acid, and its sighting foretells approaching death. The legend may have originated as a warning to the foolish of the desert's impending dangers. But there are those who interpret and use archaeological findings from the Gobi to point to evidence of the monster. A dinosaur egg and the remains of the first mammals, dating back to the Jurassic period 164 million years ago, were discovered in the northern part of the desert. The Mongolians claim that once you know where to look, you can find a piece of prehistory in less than 30 minutes. The multicolored sand grains vary in weight. The wind carries the lightest layer, which is why the singing sands appear to change shape constantly. It appears that the three sisters and the singing desert only know how to take lives. On the other hand, the Gobi Desert is a place that can give life as well as take it. The rarely seen and highly endangered Przalski's horse can be spotted on the desert's periphery. Zoologists are slowly reintroducing this breed from zoos back into the wild. We can take off to the Yolin Am Pass in pursuit of unusual and varied life forms. It is here that we find myriad glacier-fed streams. In the winter, the pass is covered by a layer of ice several meters thick and many kilometers long. Due to the surrounding mountain walls, the pass remains shaded and so the ice thaws gradually. The last bits disappear sometime in September, shortly before the onset of another winter. Only a few years back, the ice remained year-round, but now, the relatively warmer summers of the last decade have brought an end to that. A slightly more acceptable climate due to higher altitude results in a greater variance of fauna and flora thriving here. The accessibility of water also helps. This is where the snow leopard lives, but he's rarely spotted. Horses are the universally accepted means of transport here, usurping cars. They require little maintenance and no fueling stations. The horse is a national symbol of Mongolia. It is as important to the people as their religion, Buddhism. Reaching the Tovkon Kid Temple is a long and tedious ordeal. In spite of its inaccessibility, it receives a great number of visitors. In 1936, there were over 50 temples in Mongolia. After the communists completed their purge, there were only a handful left, dozens of monks, 
occupied with the task of temple reconstruction as well as liturgy, reside at the Tofkon Kid Temple. The Tofkon Kid Temple is an important pilgrimage site for the Mongolians. It is the place where one of the greatest national thinkers, Zanabazar, chose to meditate. It is said that those who would lie on the floor of the adjoining cave will be purged of sin. Plentiful gifts testify to the gratitude of those previously purified. Impressive views of the surrounding woods are the ultimate reward for those men who reach the summit of Tovkon Kid. For some obscure reason, women are denied access to this vantage point. Pilgrims are drawn to the temple by Zanabazar's legacy. No lesser an attraction is a spring whose sacred waters are deemed to have healing properties. A contrast more stark may be difficult to find. The scorching dunes of the Singing Desert, as opposed to the 1100 kilometer long river Orkhan, the river valley is so strikingly beautiful, it was included as a national heritage site by UNESCO. The highlight of this river's course is a 20 meter high waterfall. The unpredictable weather can cause it to run dry, sometimes for as long as 10 consecutive months. In the springtime, during the thaw, the waterfall is quite impressive. It is highly advisable to visit Kovsgald Nur Lake in order to fully appreciate the extent of the diversity one finds in Mongolia. It lies in the north on the Russian border, and it is one of the largest lakes in the country. This lake, similar to one aspect of the Gobi, has a few numerical records to its credit. It was formed two million years ago, and as such, belongs in the league of the world's 17 oldest lakes. In some places, its depth exceeds 260 meters. It is a carefully protected water mass, separating the Central Asian steppes from the Siberian taiga. It supplies 17% of Mongolia with fresh water. Its surface area of almost 3,000 square kilometers makes it Mongolia's second largest lake. Its shores abound with incredible animal diversity, from the ibex and reindeer to the wolves, wolverines, and bears. An honored member of the bird kingdom is the endemic Hovsgol grayling. The underwater life is not quite as rich as in the nearby Lake Baikal. Even so, it is an important source of food for the local settlers. The incredible abundance of water and the life it sustains seems like a fairy tale to the traditional desert herdsmen. Similarly, the people from the lakeshores find it difficult to comprehend that there could exist places very near to them where water must be brought in from several kilometers away. As a result of protections like the prohibition of industrial fishing, the water here is crystal clear. The authorities meticulously regulate fishing. Fishermen living on the shores of the lake are forbidden to use large boats. One of the benefits from all the regulations results in a high quantity of fish that can be pulled from the lake. As a result, we can sit down to a fine meal of all the Kovsgolsk smoked fish, which include Siberian whitefish, Siberian grayling, Baigalai omul, and river perch. The lake and its beautiful surroundings continues to attract an increasing number of visitors 
causing the development of local tourism to become vital. The nomadic Uyghurs arrive from the mountains and other distant parts of the country during warmer weather. They temporarily settle on the lake shores and go about their business, reindeer breeding for example, to the curiosity of the locals from the surrounding towns and villages. This area of the lake might just well as be named Mongolian Switzerland. Dense forests form the southern border of the Siberian taiga. The dominant tree is the Siberian larch. Its resilience to the bitter cold makes it more than able to thrive here. It grows to a height of 50 meters and the trunk can be a meter in diameter. In the autumn, its leaves, resembling pine needles, turn yellow and adorn the forest floor. As the forests retreat, the Central Asian plains open up. The plains are an ideal environment for the rearing of animals, such as sheep, yak, and horses. Let us leave Mongolia behind and move over to a place where the sun, Islam, and the Dead Sea dominate. Jordan awaits. Over the past millennia, the rocky slopes of Jordan witnessed their fair share of bloody battles, new settlers, and other events recorded in the Old Testament. The first mention of civilization comes from the Paleolithic Age. In the years following, the area was ruled by different entities over time, from the Egyptian pharaohs, to the Persian Empire, to the Judean Kingdom, and to the Babylonians, to name just a few. All these cultures left behind traces of their reign, and all were aware of the unique qualities of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, also known as the Sea of Salt, lies in the Jordan Rift Valley. That valley also contains other significant lakes, none of which are as salty, or lie 378 meters below sea level. A liter of Dead Sea water contains an incredible 1.2 kilos of salt, making its water uninhabitable to all but a few bacteria. But humans found a good use for this water. According to the Bible, King David found refuge on its shores, and Herod the Great established one of the very first health spas here, intended for recreation and the healing of various diseases. The Egyptians utilized the salty water for mummification purposes. Today's visitors come here mostly to heal respiratory and skin diseases. Many beneficial minerals evaporate from the water, and the ultraviolet rays of the sun ensure a higher concentration of oxygen here than elsewhere. The water contains almost 10 times more salt than the ocean. As a result, people here enjoy incredible buoyancy. The salty crystals form a fascinating miniature landscape. The salty crust results from the condensation of minerals from the air and the diminishing water supplies. According to some rather skeptical prognoses, the Dead Sea is to vanish over the next 40 years. The Dead Sea is also being utilized for industrial production, its southern part. Looking somewhat considerably different from the moonscape seen in our shot has been taken over by mining companies. The substance of interest is potash, potassium carbonate. It is essential in the manufacture of soap, glass, fertilizers, and cyanide. Life in the desert is subject to unwritten and unchanging laws of uncompromising nature. Nowadays, the Bedouins have cars, used mostly to fetch water alongside their camel herds. In spite of such modern conveniences, they stick to very simple and traditional lives. 
One of the most important attributes of a Bedouin is hospitality. They are taught from childhood to invite a traveler into your home and feed him, because one day you too may need a place to sleep and a bite to eat. Traditional cuisine and the traditional sweet, sticky tea are a must. Living in such austere surroundings, it is not surprising that the Bedouins cherish friendship and hospitality above all. The land is saturated with history and as such attracts hundreds of visitors each year. Archaeological sites of the mysterious extinct Nabataean civilization drew awestruck anthropologists and archaeologists from around the world. The masses of tourists visiting the more than kilometer-long pass are similarly dumbfounded. Having left the pass behind, an incredible spectacle comes into sight. Known as the treasure chest, it is the symbol of the lost city of Petra. Indiana Jones was the most famous fictional visitor who traveled to Petra in search of the Holy Grail, which actually is the tomb of a Nabataean king. According to an Arabic belief, this is where Moses caused the rock to bring forth water when he struck the rock with his staff. A treasure of unimaginable worth is hidden in the facade according to a medieval legend. Petra has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1985. The sheer number of standing ruins could indicate that Petra was once densely populated. This wasn't the case. Petra was, above all, a ritual pilgrimage site and a cemetery. The remains of tombs are evident in every rock. The Nabataeans were nomads and merchants. They understood the desert and its secrets, enabling them to transport caravans of valuable goods such as frankincense, spice, and myrrh. They used their profits to prepare homes for their afterlives in the sandstone mountains. At the beginning of the second century, the Nabataeans clashed with the Romans. Their legacy was the Byzantine Episcopate and a wide range of authentic mosaics on the floors. Petra was slowly forgotten with the passing of time as its importance ceased to exist, together with the Nabataeans. The secret of the past was only known to the Bedouins who, until recently, inhabited some of the rooms in the rocks. Today, Petra is open to all. We bid farewell to the dignified Jordanian landscape. It has been through a lot and is rightfully praised as one of the most interesting tourist destinations. Allah Yismayak, God be with you, Jordan. <laughs>